Well, a couple of days ago, mornings ago, I'd had a, a, an interesting dream, and in this dream, I had gone to a large church, like large, you know, compared to us, was I would say around uh, three, four hundred people, and I heard, and this just the way it was in the dream, the seventh prophet, which is an odd phrase. But set number seven, as we know, is a number of completion and perfection. So the seventh prophet had spoken. I'm coming back telling this story now to this church. I've come back from that church. I'm telling this, the story about that visit with them. And that prophet said, the Lord is coming very soon. Soon, because there's only a few left to be saved. And then I saw numbers. I don't know what those numbers were. But I knew, in the base in the population of the world, that that's just a little bit under eight eight billion people in the world, and so I knew that this the few was would be somewhere in the hundreds of millions, which is not very many on the grand scale, but to us it, it's a, a huge amount. And then I thought, uh, as I was telling this, I began to weep, and I said, Lord, I pray that our loved ones will be in that number. Yes. And, and then a thought crossed my mind. I wrote, added an addendum on, onto this, you know, because they're talking about the Antichrist. You know, we just had this guy come out and give all the reasons why King Charles is the Antichrist. They're all valid reasons. They all fit every prophetic thing. And everybody talks about, uh, is the Antichrist alive now? Well, I want to flip that on us so not something that another uh, nobody else thinks about because I have a sense in that that the last soul that'll be, ever be saved before Jesus comes is alive right now. You ever just just that thought was to me was a very interesting thought. The last soul that will ever be saved before Jesus' return is alive now. Think about that. You know, I was like, well, who is it? Who is? It? You know, include that in the number. Well, then. Esther told me what said, you know, for tonight, she told me a couple of days ago that she wanted the, the, uh, uh, the uh, prodigal's mm -hmm. bag brought over. And so I went over this morning and, and it was laying on the, I had placed it on the communion table. And I went over, I went up the communion table first thing when I, when I got over there to make sure I didn't, didn't forget it. And the, uh, communion tray from Sunday was still sitting there, and this was right next to it. And I heard the Lord say, so let a man examine himself. And he took me on a, on a journey with King David that morning. I, I was just writing down the different thoughts that he give, had given to him, and I thought, David, just putting it in more of a modernist sense about it, is David grew up in church. You know, I thought, when these were laying there, it crossed my mind how many of these sat in church and took communion. And I connect that and, and had made, so let a man examine himself. And they took it back, and so many times it was just the first Sunday of every month was communion Sunday. That means they took it. And, and bringing it more personal, how many of us it really examine ourselves because we don't most of the time we don't we are so kind to ourselves we are so the human rational because I thought about this in relationship to David how did he rationalize his conduct what he did he knew he was violating the law in many places coveting the neighbor's wife committing adultery committing murder Lying, all of the things that he did was just all of the, to wrap around, and then he involved other people in his sin. He said, "Who is that woman?" They told her, who's that? and he sent somebody to go get her and bring her. He involved somebody else in his sin, and they brought. Now you know that these people knew. You know that who the guy that got him, got her and brought her to the palace. And she's there for a period of time. You know that he had ideas and opinions. And all the people that worked in the palace had ideas and opinions. But they wouldn't say anything because they knew he'd snap their head off. I mean, chop their head off. So they're, they're all this quiet and everybody. 
knows what's going on and he's rationalizing all of this and then it just builds and you know in his heart he's, he's trying the big cover-up and how many times have we rationalized our conduct our, our speech our attitudes the things that we've done how many times have we rationalized and justified it and then even to the point with in David's case when she come back with she's preg that, that she's pregnant, so now the cover-up gets even bigger. And he goes, when we fall into the pit of sin, it doesn't get easier, it gets worse. It never gets better. It always takes, sucks us down the spiral of degradation. So what you follow what David did, he went and sunk deeper and deeper into that hole. And now he's plotting and planning. And you know the military knew something's up because they knew why would the king do what he did to send your eye out into the worst of the battle and tell the people to draw back mm -hmm. they knew but everybody was afraid to say anything and he just he just covers up but here's the thing that really got me when I was on this journey was that David after Uriah is killed Oh, that wonderful King David, wasn't that compassionate and thoughtful of him? Now here's his wife is just newly pregnant and her husband's dead. Wasn't that great? The king took her in and just, you know, to provide and take care. It really looks, we want ourselves to really look good to the community, to our neighbors, to our family, you know, so we, make, we do all of these things and so everybody out there thinks, wow, there's, David, you're so awesome. Not everybody would do what you just did and take his, they didn't know out there. They don't know the true story. But there are people that do know the true story, including David knew this true story. And he just kept lying to himself. He think this will take, this covered up. This will, everything will be fine. And we, took, we never repent. We just try to move past it. Never acknowledge it. Never deal with it but it just compounds itself and it gets bigger and it's a door until we deal with it till we repent of it that door will always stay open there's only one way to shut that door because the devil will bring his garbage in through that door suitcase at a time a suitcase at a time and david dealt with that for a year i mean can you imagine going on for a year some people go for years <laughs> plural not willing to deal with the issues in their life so let a man examine himself and so I you know I thought bring that bring up one of that chair right here out into the middle of the room I'm gonna put these on here but I'm gonna ask a question because so many of those sat in our sat in our church we never expected to what happened to would that would have happened to them they all seemed to be doing good they all seemed they were singing they were standing in the altars they were joining the prayer they were doing all of these things and then they're gone so i was thinking we we're telling this whole journey to esther this i said would, how about one of you would one of you be next would one of you be next one sitting in this chair because we have issues we won't deal with oh it's not going to be me if you'd have told David, see it was 14 years from the first time he was anointed king that this happened. Seven years after he brought, went back, got the ark and brought the ark in. Oh, hallelujah, I'm dancing, I'm worshiping. I'm having, you would have never imagined if somebody had told him, David, one day you're going to do this and this and all this. this he would have probably laughed, thought you're crazy. That's not going to happen to me. I'm faithful. I go, I worship. I do all of these things and I'm so spiritual. And it's never going to happen to me, but it did. Anytime any one of us think that we're exempt of that happening is deceiving ourselves. And that's what goes way back to the very beginning when I picked those things up. So let a man or woman or a teenager or a child really honestly examine yourselves and be gut level honest dig down to the bottom of the barrel the things that we kept hidden david kept it hidden for a year it must have been the longest year of his life but all those things that he was not willing to deal with it what if he had died what if he'd gone out to battle i even asked the question i couldn't find an answer yet but in that year did he win any battles 
when he went to war because he was the open door to failure. And when we look at that, one of you, one of us, could be the open door to stopping a move of God mm -hmm. because we're not unwilling, because we're doing what David did. We're justifying, we're, cover, we're covering, we're making, making David, you really look good to everybody. That's the thing that really caught my mind when the Lord was journeying me through this is I would have never thought of it that on my own, <laughs> for sure, that he had to really look good to the community, you know, to, to his church family, because he had, why he took her in, wasn't such a nice guy, such considerate, so thoughtful. Can you imagine that, taking her in and helping her and taking care of her and, and seeing that that baby's taking, you know, all of these things that, that, that what it looked like to everybody else. But the, David knew, and there was other people that, that really knew the truth, but everybody was afraid to say anything until, until Nathan comes along. And what does it take sometimes for us? We can keep it hidden, keep it hidden, keep it hidden, but you can't hide anything from God. He knows everything, everything about us, and He wants... He wants us to get it right. He wants to bring revival into your life, into your home, into the church. Mm -hmm. But until we, uh, you know, stubbornness, rebel, all it takes, we're so prideful. Well, what will people think of me? We think, well, you're repenting, you're getting right relationship with God. Wonderful, hallelujah. But we're so afraid of our image. David was so afraid of it. What will people think if they, if they knew the truth? Well, now, since this happened, since Samuel wrote the book, everybody knows. Jesus said, what you do in secret, I'll shout from the housetop. Well, I thought anyway, this was an interesting journey, but it's a journey that we want to examine because I thought when I picked those up this morning, I was reminded of some of those people. We served them communion. They took it. They, we, 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 we read the scriptures in 1 Corinthians about communion. We, we said it, and, and we, we do all of the stuff. We are so churchy, and we know how to do it. And we go for the big things. I didn't do any big thing. But all the little things of bitterness, holding a grudge, lying. I'm amazed at how many Christians have no problem with lying. You know, that's, that, I think that's one of the things that bugs me the most is people that will lie. I can almost deal with all the other stuff, you know, understand all the other stuff. But lying is the one that irks me the most. Maybe it's because growing up, I always looked guilty even when I was innocent. <laughs> but why do we have such a hard time with telling the truth and being honest with ourselves and with each other? So I thought about that, and we talked about that. Could one of us, Jesus said it, come on, one of you shall betray me. And they all said, and this is another thing, I've talked about this in the past, they all did, at least they were honest, Lord, is it I? Is it all of them, all 12 of them mm -hmm. were questioning themselves at that time. Could I possibly be the one that betrays him? Is there something in me that comes a little bit short of what I should be that I could possibly betray him? That, that really should cause us to stop and think. When these people that walked and talked and slept and worked and ate with Jesus, could ask themselves that question. Don't ever think that it's that potential isn't in any one of us sitting in this room right now. Could one of us be the next person sitting in the prodigal chair? So let a man examine himself something to think about.
So we're going to let, let a man examine a woman, a child, a young person, a teenager. We don't have any children. Take, take a moment and examine. Be honest. If there's anything, anything that we need to deal with in ourselves, now's the time. Mm -hmm. You need to deal with it right now and not put it off any longer because there's a lot at stake. And if you got pride that's keeping you from dealing with it, you better get rid of your pride because too many people go to hell with their pride. That's right. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He will lift you up. So we need to deal with our Anything that might be there, just go down into the, into the corners of your spiritual closet or your carnal closet. We always make everything spiritual, which in a sense it is, but sometimes with it, well, that doesn't matter there. That's not a biggie. We've been praying for this is our 26th year that we've been praying for a revival. So could any one of us be the one or some, several of it be the ones that at this juncture are holding it up. The last soul to be saved before Jesus returns is alive now. That doesn't mean he's five. He may be 55 or 85. Or newborn. Or Yeah. So, so we can't go face down, but put your... Put your spiritual posture face down on the floor before the Lord and pastor is going to pray and you guys work through things. Uh, there's a reason why this is coming out. Uh, it it's, provokes all of us. And if you're feeling unprovoked, you might want to take a needle and stick in your body somewhere and see if you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> because this is pretty serious, uh, pretty serious message tonight. So uh, spiritually posture yourself face down. Father, in the name of Jesus, we position Amen. ourselves at your feet. Mm -hmm. Self-examination is probably one of the hardest things that we can ever do. Yes, Lord. Being honest with ourselves. Forgive us, Lord. We're more concerned about our image and how we look to others. That we do mental gymnastics concerning issues, things in our lives to rationalize, to justify. Yes, Lord. Eternity is forever. It's nothing to be trifled with. Sin is nothing to be shrugged off and taken lightly. These little areas to us, they seem so little, but Lord, they're doorstoppers. They block your entrance. They rob us of victory. They rob us of peace. They rob us of joy. They rob us of your presence and that close union and fellowship that Kay talked about walking and talking with Jesus every day. And sometimes we deceive ourselves because when we have and know and harbor things in our lives that we know that are contrary to the Word of God, we fool ourselves into thinking that we're walking and talking with, with, with God when the Bible tells us if we regard iniquity in our heart, the Lord won't hear us. We can just be talking to the wind. Lord, tonight, right now, by the Holy Spirit, we give you permission to dig deep. Give us a humble heart, a contrite spirit, a willingness, if need to be, to be broken before you. Yes, Lord. Because we know all the brothers and sisters will rejoice when one, when uh, one sinner is saved, when one person comes to victory, when the strongholds of the enemy and the lies of the enemy are broken off, when self-deceit is conquered by truth and love and grace. 
So Holy Spirit, speak to every heart and every life and bring us to a place of cleansing, a place of victory, a place of peace that we have not known before, or at least it's been a long time. Lord, may we truly empty the spiritual trash. I shut the mouth of that lying spirit. They would tell us, you're just fine, you're all right. We'll just move on and go on and you can continue like you were. You can keep doing what you've always done. And they'll all move on. And everybody will think everything is okay, but it, when it's not. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Do a deep cleansing work in every heart and in every life. Lord, if there's a level of our thinking that needs to be changed, Lord, we know Amnon had a friend. Lord, if there's people speaking into our life and things that are not godly, things that are contrary to your word, shut those mouths. May we recognize it, that it's leading us away from, not to, away from truth, away from the word, which means away from you. That we would lead back to your presence, that we would know the sweet peace and joy of knowing, being in right, right relationship with you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There is always a reason why God lays that type of word because there's a need and um, don't take it lightly when God brings that level of uh, an encounter with his people. You know, let's all take it very, very seriously that there's a cause. We have our little baggie down there and we have people that we love, people that have partaken of communion. They've been in the altars, they've received prayer, they've been on the floor in the spirit and they prophesied and they've interceded and they sang the songs of revival and yet today they're far from the Lord. I can think of several in there that I know were part of the move of God here and then maybe some of yours that you have in there have not really known the Lord. Maybe they've known religion or maybe they just had just enough to make them feel they're okay or they don't want anymore. I don't know. But um, God has a way of getting hold of people's hearts. And I don't know about you, but I am not willing that any of these miss the last call of whatever wraps up before the Lord's coming. We know we can tell by the signs of the time that it's getting so close in just prophetic fulfillment of things that just even Christ talked about in Matthew 24 that he said these are the signs of the time, the signs of the end of the world. and. Boy, so many of those have not just happened, they've escalated in fervor, demonic fervor and uh, frequency and intensity. So uh, the Antichrist spirit's trying very, very hard right now to um, set his throne in place. And the church is in a major warfare right now. But for me, this right here is, I have grandchildren's name in here. This is the battlefield of my heart. I know other people, I want everybody to get saved, but this is where our battlefield is, and it's right here in the human heart. We love our people, we love their souls, we don't want to see them miss out, go out into eternity not knowing the Lord. I mean, we know that the straight gate and the Broadway, you know, there's two choices, and we want them to have an encounter with God that will literally um, alter their course in life, and that God would encounter them in their pig pens of life and really wake them up. I don't know how he's going to do it, and I'm not his counselor, but I know that they need a wake-up call. They need a, a word. They need a voice, somebody to um, intrude into their comfort zones. And actually, whether it's an angel or God's spirit or somebody sent their way or us, we have to, we have to reach out. 
Lord, we come against the spirit of death and suicide. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. That often happens when one reaches the bottom and they feel there's no hope. They feel they've gone too far and done too much. Lord, I come against that spirit of suicide and the lying spirits that would speak into their lives, trying to tell them to take their life in Jesus' name. That one that would try to shoot it up with drugs and overdose. We speak life, Lord, just block the, block the plans of the enemy in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Father, we come against that spirit of witchcraft and divination in the name of Jesus. Lord, so many are dabbling and playing. Some have gone beyond just dabbling and have entered right into it, Lord, deceived. They're looking for something what they believe is real, something supernatural. And Lord, this is a death pat, trap. Lord, it's, we just come against that spirit of divination and witchcraft and, in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Lord, we call the powers of the enemy null and void. We command the demonic forces and into, intrusion into their lives and homes. We command them to back off in the name of Jesus. We, let, we claim these souls for the kingdom of God. Lord, build a fence and a protection around them against demonic intrusion. May their lives be preserved and not taken. May the plans of the enemy be, be blocked by the power of God. Send your mighty angels in battle array against the forces of darkness that are trying to take them out. Lord, even as demons try to work against them to destroy, Lord, your angels come and do your work and your, and the battle on your behalf. So, Lord, send however many is necessary in the battle, Lord, for the protection and the saving of their soul. We ask, God, that you would send them to our loved ones. I pray for the body of Christ here, Lord, that there not one would be lost, not one would even be thinking or living on the, on the outer edges of the kingdom. But Lord, that we would all, especially tonight, draw closer to the center of the kingdom, focused on your purpose. Yes. Lord, laying aside every distraction and every weight and sin that so easily besets us, that we would run with patience that race that is set before us, Lord, that we would find strength in one another, that we would be unified in the body of Christ, or unified in the battle, unified as an army, single-minded, single-purpose, Father, in the name of Jesus. You get the feeling that God's getting real serious about our condition and about our loved ones and all of this. Seems like it's just a really uh, sobering night. Don't, uh, don't let this be the only time that you really give pause to think about um, daily sanctification is what the Bible calls for. That means tonight you've sanctified yourself, but tomorrow you may have to do some washing and ironing. You've got to keep on it because the humanness and the flesh of us always wants to rise up. We have to do our warfare daily. And Remember, we've said so many times in the last days is deception. And every one of us are, can be subject to the falling into the trap of deception. In other words, something that sounds good. We just listened to somebody today, supposed to be a preacher, and they were spewing out all this stuff, and it kind of might sound good, but it just didn't ring true. And you got to go back, boy, you're living, you need to know the word because there's so much deception out there by people and in the churches of course the fact that they're going woke and accepting all that tells you how bad but some of it's not as blatant as that some of it's more subtle father we want to thank you for your grace and mercy again thanking you lord for each one as part of this fellowship for their love their commitment and support we're thankful lord for uh, all that they are and all that they do and even the love of their generosity we ask, Father God, that your angels would go with them as we close out this meeting, as they head for their homes, that you'd have raise up a wall of protection around them, not only tonight, but as continually in all their comings and goings. And Lord, that you'd eradicate every demonic spirit out of their homes and off of their property, that it would be established as a safe haven and a place where your spirit dwells, where peace and joy reigns. Lord, we just bless them with every good thing that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen.